I'm Roger McIntyre, Professor of Psychiatry and Pharmacology at University of Toronto. I'm head of the Mood Disorder Psychopharmacology Unit at the University Health Network. I'm also the Executive Director of the Brain and Cognition Discovery Foundation in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Welcome to today's session entitled Metabolism and Mood Disorders, Implications for Mechanisms and Treatment. What we're going to do today is we're going to discuss the role of disturbances in metabolism, what it means for understanding disease models and mood disorders, and what does it mean for possibly very novel, genuinely novel, possibly disease-modifying and curative approaches for people who have mood disorders. We know that people who have impaired glucose tolerance, insulin resistance, or type 2 diabetes, or type 1 diabetes, have impairments in cognitive functions. There's something about alterations in glucose or insulin homeostasis that contributes to decreased cognitive performance in people of younger years of life, middle years, and certainly late life. We also know that whether or not someone has uh, diabetes or not, we know broadly that disturbances in glucose uh, regulatory function is highly associated not only with cognitive impairment, but also anhedonia, that is the absence of pleasure. And we know that anhedonia correlates with cognitive function, but it is a very, very different phenomenon. We are beginning to learn that the uh, relationship between impairment in glucose insulin homeostasis and cognition and anhedonia can be understood across several levels or so-called units of analysis. What I'm going to do though is just focus on a couple of these units beginning with the molecular unit. First of all, we have reasons to believe that insulin is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. It inhibits Mayo A and B enzyme in the outer mitochondrial membrane of the, in this case, the neuron. And when neurons are insulin insensitive, what happens is there's decreased capability to suppress Mayo activity resulting in relative overexpression of mayo and increased turnover of catecholamine. This results in a decrease in pleasure capacity as evidenced by increased measures of anhedonia. Insulin is in the brain uh, serving more of a, a, a neuroprotective, neuromodulatory, neurotrophic role, not required for glucose utilization. We know that insulin uh, inhibits the pro-apoptotic machinery, that is premature cell death, and facilitates plasticity processes like long-term potentiation. It's interesting that we also now know that insulin can suppress the um, protein systems implicated in the neurobiology of Alzheimer's disease like hyperphosphorylated tau or for the uh, glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta. And there's a convergent uh, story here that type 2 diabetes particularly is uh, linked to Alzheimer's disease mechanistically, perhaps in part through its effect on some of these intracellular signaling ca cascades uh, represented by uh, insulin as the starting component. One of the newer technologies we have is called exosomes, and exosomes give us the ability to look at uh, brain insulin resistance. Um, one of the difficulties we have methodologically is that peripheral insulin resistance does not correlate with brain insulin resistance, but there's some emerging evidence that in fact we, with a technology called exosomes, we can actually look at these um, vehicles as a proxy of brain insulin function. And it's been shown that in diseases known to have brain insulin resistance, like Alzheimer's disease, there's an alteration um, in insulin resistance in the peripherally measured exosomes. And this is a very new, very exciting new methodology that we're now beginning to look at. In previous modules, we've talked about sirtuins. Sirtuins are histone deacetylase proteins implicated not only in cellular survival and cellular aging, but also metabolism, inflammation, as well as the stress response. And there's evidence now that sirtuin activity, at least some of the isoforms like uh, sirtuin 1 or sirtuin 7, are reduced in people subject, are animals and people subjected to stress like major depression. Uh, this suggests that, that sirtuin enhancement could have potential beneficial effects on metabolism as well as depression. Uh, there are some interesting approaches to this, caloric restriction and resveratrol. Resveratrol is the active moiety in red wine have demonstrated actually search when enhancing uh, properties. Our group's been very interested in incretins. Incretins are gut peptides. They communicate to the brain. They are a satiety signal to the brain, uh, among other things. Um, but search is also produced in the brain, in the nucleus tractus solitarius. And the nucleus tractus does have uh, communication to reward circuitry. And it's believed that some of the uh, uh, appetite suppressing effects of incretins in the brain may in fact be through the nucleus tractus solitarius. 
We also know that GLP-1 uh, receptors, messenger RNA and protein, is distributed throughout the cognitive control networks. And this has provided the basis for us studying this particular protein system uh, in individuals who have uh, mood disorders. And I'll show you some very interesting data very early on uh, in, in a few moments. Uh, what's also very interesting is that uh, we know that as you increase in, uh, glucose, you increase inflammation, and inflammation is highly associated with hippocampal damage. And so the link between diabetes and brain disease is not only directly through insulin or incretin systems, but also is indirectly through inflammatory systems as uh, glucose, uh, which is elevated and is uh, chronically elevated is known to be highly pro-inflammatory. There's been a wealth of studies now that have shown uh, changes in brain structure and brain function in people who have diabetic conditions or conditions of insulin resistance, whether it be diabetes or depression or bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. But one of the challenges in interpretation of these studies is that peripheral insulin resistance and central insulin resistance are not in fact correlated. Our team at Toronto has been looking at a whole variety of very novel approaches to targeting the inflammatory system as well as the metabolic system as potentially uh, novel ways to suppress symptoms, improve cognition, reduce anhedonia, but also perhaps to modify the disease and maybe also in fact cure the disease. For example, intranasally delivered insulin which does not affect peripheral glucose levels has been shown to improve cognition in individuals who have bipolar disorder when it's been added to their conventional therapy. Uh, we don't know yet whether in major depression this is the case. Recently we published a study showing that intranasal insulin could improve cognition in major depression, but we had to, uh, difficulties in interpreting this finding because we also had a very high placebo response rate in that study, which is very common actually in patients who have major depressive disorder, so clearly more work is needed. Suzanne Kraft and colleagues have demonstrated that intranasal insulin can improve cognition function in mild cognitive impairment, people with early Alzheimer's disease, particularly people who have uh, APOE negative Alzheimer's disease, which is a very interesting finding indeed. Earlier I, made a, uh, I commented about liraglutide and its potential brain therapeutic role. It's been shown to have potent trophic and neurogenic effects in a variety of animal models, including but not limited to Alzheimer's models. And um, one of our colleagues in Korea recently has demonstrated that liraglutide in an animal model is not just procognitive, but actually behaves as an antidepressant. Recently, our team has published some data showing that liraglutide is not only antidepressant, but is procognitive, providing some evidence that, in fact, this incretin is brain therapeutic. And it's also been shown that incretins, in fact, can uh, engage uh, the brain as we measure the effect on, on the brain using magnetic resonance spectroscopy, specifically looking at uh, uh, N-acetyl spartate levels, seeing a change in this marker of neuronal viability across four weeks of, of actual treatment. What I thought was so interesting is that liraglutide not only improves depression and engages cognitive control networks, but also was shown to improve measures of cognition in people who actually have depression. Again, earlier I made reference to uh, resveratrol, I made uh, evidence, uh, of, um, evidence of caloric restriction uh, affecting sirtuin activity. There's also the capability of modulating sirtuin activity with pharmacological approaches. A few experimental approaches are underway, and we have some evidence now indicating that, the, that, that modulating with a, an exogenous approach, whether it be a, a pharmaceutical or resveratrol, in fact, can increase sirtuin activity, which has in fact been shown, as a matter of fact, to reduce uh, the overall stress response in the animal. Moreover, we do know that in patients who have mild cognitive impairment, it seems though resveratrol may slow hippocampal volume reduction in this group, which is a very interesting proof of concept about the possible role of sirtuins. Finally, I said a couple of words about uh, incretins and their role in persons with mood disorders. Incretins, or for that matter, what's called dipeptidyl peptidase inhibitors, uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, have been also looked at uh, as possible procognition strategies targeting incretin systems, and in this case, in MCI or Alzheimer's disease, in fact, showing some perhaps preservation of cognitive functions in this group. So to summarize, we know that persons who have psychiatric disorders, specifically major depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease, and PTSD, have high rates of impaired glucose tolerance. And we also have people who have impaired glucose tolerance or frank diabetes are differentially affected by uh, mental disorders. Where we find the greatest level of convergence is in cognitive impairment and anhedonia. There's a variety of convergent substrates here 
and we're using this information to inform very novel treatment approaches, repurposing existing anti-diabetic or anti-inflammatory agents, as well as developing genuinely novel innovative pharmacological approaches to improve cognition in people who have brain-based or conditions that affect the brain resulting in impairment in cognition. Again, the modalities are not confined to pharmacotherapy. It could also include psychosocial treatments, uh, exercise treatments, and a whole variety of other behavioral approaches that perhaps could uh, modulate uh, cognition in a favorable way. So thank you for uh, joining me for this particular program.